Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online and subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. You can find us online over at quicksurf.com. And uh, inside the show notes for every episode, I've got a heading uh, called subscribe. And you, in, in there, you'll find a link to subscribe to an Og Vorbis feed, an MP3 feed, and a video feed that's compatible with a wide range of devices. So do feel free to subscribe. You can also find us online over at uh, YouTube, Dailymotion, Blip.tv, stitcher.com and tunein.com so there's a variety of places if you prefer to use another platform where you can find us over there as well let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff i found for this episode uh over at read write web in their mobile section they have an article here ios 7 rumor watch black white and flat all over this is there's been some rumor swirling around about the next version of ios that runs on uh, iphones and uh, ipod touches and ipads and all of apple's mobile devices and um johnny ives has uh, supposedly taken over uh the ui interface design for ios and so you know the the rumor is it's going to be flattened out quite a bit uh, there's going to be, you know, a fair amount of reworking, so it's less skeuomorphic. I think that's a good thing. I'm not really a huge fan of skeuomorphic design. Um, I think it's appropriate in some instances, but uh, Apple, at least under Scott Forstall uh, in iOS, really kind of made skeuomorphism, uh, you know, took it to a f- you know fairly high extreme. So there's some pretty cool stuff here. Um, be interesting to see uh, what comes of it you know obviously uh you know worldwide developers conferences is, is right around the corner so we'll we'll hopefully be hearing a lot more about this in not the not too distant future over at make.com five million lego brick star wars x-wing starfighter what that's right this thing is awesome for lack of a better way of describing it so it's the largest Lego build of all time. It's an X-Wing Starfighter from Star Wars. It was unveiled in Times Square in New York City. Um, it's uh, heading over to Legoland California Resort for a permanent installation. It's a T-65 Starfighter built entirely out of Lego bricks. This thing looks spectacular. You've got to check this out. I can't believe how humongous this thing is it's huge so anyway uh definitely take a look uh, it it's it's beautiful it really is so so check it out uh from bbc news and their technology section smart meters need to be harder to hack experts say this is kind of a wake-up call we've all are kind of aware of cyber security issues in the in the you know in the internet and home use sector well you know, companies have the same problem, particularly utilities, especially when it starts getting into things like smart meters where they automatically, you know, the meter is not a mechanical reading of the gas flowing through your house and, you know, and it's a little set of dials and they send a meter reader out to go and read the meter. Um, you know, it's, it's starting to become a lot more electronic. Same thing with electricity. You know, it's starting to become a lot more electronic, which means that, you can now start to hack them if you so desire. So this uh, is kind of an expose, if you will. Really interesting read uh, about the security and the state of security in the smart meter space. Definitely check it out. From Make, there's a, a DIY 3D laser scanner project using an Arduino. This is pretty neat. Um, it uses a laser, a DSLR, and an Arduino controller. Pretty interesting. There's some uh, pictures of the types of scans this does. I'm shocked. It's actually pretty high resolution. So definitely give it a check out. Over at Mashable.com, customize and code your own robots with LinkBot. 
That's right. California-based company Barobo is all about robots. Their newest invention, LinkBot, is a modular robotic platform that lets you build and customize your own robot block by block like Legos. You start with a single bot. It's ready to go as is, but you can add your own flavor by connecting two or more bots together into different shapes. What's especially cool is the hands-on coding feature called Pose Teach, which allows you to program the bot with your hands on the outside instead of a keyboard. So pretty interesting. Definitely give it a look. From Hack a Day, I'm I ran across this article. This is awesome. I, I just I had to include it. I've always been a huge fan of lasers. Uh, three watt handheld laser is the 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 uh, the title of this article is three watt handheld laser raises hope for a real lightsaber someday. There's a uh, video on uh, YouTube uh, of the guy who has this um, testing it out against different materials. For a handheld laser, three watts is frightening. Um, I wow, it's really frightening. I don't know if I could uh, be trusted with a three watt handheld laser. I'll just put it that way. Definitely check it out. Really neat. Uh, from Wired.com, planets converge to form a rare glowing triangle this weekend. That's right, so keep an eye out uh, this weekend. Uh, three planets will nestle together in the western sky at twilight to form a rarely seen glowing triangle. With good timing and a bit of luck, you should be able to see it without a telescope. Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter have been converging in the sky for the past month and will form their tightest clump on Sunday, May 26th. This triple conjunction, visible from most of North America and Europe, will be easiest to see with the naked eye between 30 and 60 minutes after sunset, according to NASA. So they've got a nice YouTube video that uh, kind of gives a, an idea of how to spot it. Really cool. If you're into astronomy or just want to see some really cool stuff, maybe take some pictures and send them, send them to me. I'll include them here on the show. Pretty neat. From Gizmodo, the Sky Ranger flies in the face of inclement weather. Quadcopters have become quite a popular choice for aerial surveillance tasks in both the public and private sectors, thanks to their portability and ease of use. The problem is their diminutive nature also limits where and when they can fly. High winds can knock them clear out of the air. The, however, the new Sky Ranger SUAS is powerful enough to lift off in conditions that would ground other drones. So. Not only is it a combination of weight, but it's really a combination of how much power the thing packs to overcome, let's say, for example, wind or inclement weather. Um, I thought it was an interesting read, which is why it's being included here. Now, this uh, next story uh, over at likecool.com, um, <laughs> I just had to include this. This is so cool. Uh, there's this guy that has a motorcycle. He calls it the Red Baron bike. And this thing is powered by one of those radial airplane engines. This is the most awesome looking bike I have ever seen in my life. It is ridiculously huge. Um, you got to check it out. They do have a YouTube video. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. It's awesome. Check it out. Over at Make, D-I-Y-O-D-E, Code Shield, the Diode, I guess, Code Shield gets a lesson plan. The Diode Code Shield is a fascinating project out of the Diode hackerspace in Guelph, Ontario. It's an Arduino shield loaded with sensors, a buzzer, a motor, LEDs, a rotary encoder, and so on. The idea is that it would help people learn Arduino programming without having them to learn about electronics first. Makes sense. This was showed off uh, first at uh, Maker Fair and even made a giant version of the shield to raise some buzz. So pretty neat. Um, if you're looking for something where you don't really want to learn electronics, but you do want to kind of monkey around with Arduino, this may be something uh, useful to play around with. Over at PCMag.com, I know I don't uh, usually include a lot of PC Mag uh, stories uh, here in the show, but... Uh, they had an article here that I, I kind of hits near and dear to my heart. Um, it's entitled why digital keeps winning despite filmmakers reluctance. Now I am a huge proponent of, you know, moving everything to digital digital cameras are just now starting to reach 
uh, you know, the quality level where not only do they have the resolution, but they also have the, the, the dynamic range or the latitude and how much light they can handle and how much, you know, dynamic range you can capture that they, they're starting to give film a run for their money. Anyway, uh, this I thought was a pretty interesting article. It starts off last year, the Tribeca Film Festival Festival screened side by side, a documentary produced by Keanu Reeves that assayed whether the sh- assayed whether the shift from film to digital movie making is inevitable and or an improvement. I have seen this movie. I highly recommend that anybody who gives, you know, two nickels, two cents about uh digital filmmaking and just digital video in general, go watch this movie. You can get it on iTunes. Uh it's for rent uh, under the documentary section. I I would love to be able to buy it. Um excellent, excellent documentary. Anyway. Uh, in a kind of sequel this year, a panel of filmmakers with the entries in Tribeca debated the merits of working in each medium. All were recently confronted with the film versus digital decision for themselves. Three of the panelists, the pretty one, uh, director Jeanne Lamarck, run and jump producer Tamara Anghi, and a birder's guide to everything director Rob Meyer, were screening movies filmed in digital while Bluebird director Lance Edmonds went with film but released his movie digitally. So, um, this kind of really interesting read. I'm not going to go into all of it, but, uh, you know, it it really does a good job of chronicling, you know, a lot of the struggles that these directors kind of had, you know, uh, you know, and, and... it's, I thought it was a very interesting read. You know, I care a lot about, you know, when I go to see a movie, I care a lot about whether it was shot on film and, or shot digitally. I actually go to IMDb and I, and I look up what the cinematographic process, cinematography, uh, the, the process that they used, um, just to see if it was shot digitally or on film. And one thing that I have been noticing in movies the last year or so, uh, is actually even the last couple years, year and a half to to year, year to year and a half, maybe two years or so, is movies shot digitally with cameras like the Red Epic or, uh, you know, where the, the acquisition, the digital acquisition was higher than 2K, but they did a 2K DI um, look a lot better you know, in case here's a dirty little secret, even if you shot on film, you, nobody edits on film anymore. It's typically scanned in it. You know, if you shoot on film, it's typically scanned in at 2k and they edited it at 2k and it gets released at 2k, uh, 2k being 2048 pixels wide by however many pixels tall to meet the aspect ratio that they need. Some movies, they, you know, maybe on huge blockbusters, they spend the money to do a 4k DI if they captured on film. But more often than not, that's not the case. You know, uh, there's a fair number of cameras out there now that are more than adequate uh, digitally um, resolution wise that are very comparable to what you're going to get with film. You know, all the film uh, people, all the people that are pro film, they're always like, you know, well, film is way more resolution and all this other stuff. And quite frankly, I, I think that they are hard pressed. I'm hard pressed to to see a movie that was actually shot in film on 35 millimeter film look better than a movie that was shot on something like a Red Epic or an Arri Alexa or something of that nature. It just it doesn't. It's particularly if they captured raw, you know. It it's I just see a lot of the newer digital films. They just look better. There's more detail resolved. You know, the picture is clearer. It just, there's a lot about acquiring particularly higher than 2K resolution digital. You know, I think film poops out. You know, you can, if you, you know, have a really high quality 35 millimeter film stock and you spend a lot of money to do a 4K DI or 4K acquisition from film to digital to get it in digital format where everybody edits, you know, when you do a lot of noise removal on the film, you can get a higher, you know, basically get a 4K equivalent 
kind of a 4K equivalent to what you'd get if you were shooting on like a Red One or something like that. But I've noticed that a lot of the higher resolution digital cameras, film ca- cinema cameras, look better than a movie shot on film. You know, this is just my own personal opinion. I'm a little biased. But I, this is something I've noticed even here shooting this show. You know, I, I, you know, there's a lot that a lot of opinions I have about the resolution at which I capture. There's a there's a reason why I do not release this and upload it to YouTube. You know, in full 1080, I'm only acquiring it 1080. I don't capture. You know, I I don't re-encode it again. The edited version at 1080 and upload it. It's going to look like crap. Pardon my language. Compared to uh releasing it at 720 so i always try to acquire the higher resolution that i release and i have you know quite a bit of opinion about what good digital acquisition formats are for the intended uh distribution mediums you know for like a lot of web medium 1280 by 720 is about it you know doing a 1080 release doesn't make a lot of sense simply because most dis- most computer displays aren't much more than particularly on laptops aren't much larger than you know 1280 by 800 number one number two most computers don't have the processing power to really you know decode a high quality 1080 you know i mean that's a lot of bandwidth you're looking at you know 10 15 megabits a second um if you want to release a a good 1080 you know even approaching blu-ray quality so you know for web distribution hd is really 720 progressive um i would love to be able to acquire at two and a half k and release at 720 progressive so i'm oversampling 2x right now i'm oversampling one and a half x i acquire at 1920 by 1080 and i release it 1280 by 720 i'd love to be able to do two and a half k for a web distribution for digital 5k minimum minimum take that Two and a half K, which is twenty five sixty by fourteen forty, double the width, double the height, four times the picture, um, you know, fifty one twenty by twenty eight eighty, I believe. Uh, that should be the minimum for acquiring for cinema, you know. So four K is a good start, you know. Red is doing good with their five K, the Red Epic. Uh, you know they're they're doing pretty good with five K acquisition. That I think is a good place to start. I'd love to see you know sixteen or even twenty four bits per color acquisition. Uh, f- you know, for for per photo site when they go and get that, it'll give more dynamic range. You know you you. you film everybody says well it's 14 15 f stops a dynamic range you know realistically if you if you want to blow film out of the water you need to you need to do at least 20 stops of dynamic range digitally you just that's just how it is so 16 bits i don't think is enough you know they're very slowly upping how many bits they use per color uh you know at some point it's going to be like look the color space is red green blue 4444 uh at least 16 bits per color minimum 5k that's just what you got to do anyway i've spoken enough about this definitely check this out it's really interesting read especially if you want to get in behind you know kind of like the mindset of a lot of the guys that struggle with this uh i highly recommend it definitely go watch side by side excellent documentary and with that i will see all of you on the next episode i'll see you then bye